He has pleaded guilty to being a felon in possession of a firearm. At sentencing, the district court clearly erred by applying a sentencing guidelines enhancement for Hughes having possessed that firearm in connection with another felony offense. Here, the basis for that enhancement was that when police officers arrested Hughes, uh, they found drugs in his pocket. There was five and a half grams of methamphetamine in a bag and then six capsules of Adderall in a separate bag. There was also a clear glass pipe with white residue in it and an unspecified amount of currency. Uh, now this case turns on whether that evidence of the drugs in his pocket supported an inference that Hughes was engaged in a drug trafficking offense or simple possession of the drugs. Now, that matters because of how the guideline says this enhancement is to be applied. So the guideline says to apply the enhancement if the defendant possessed the firearm in connection with another felony offense. And then there's an application note that sets up two different rules for applying that enhancement, a general rule and a special rule. The general rule is that the enhancement applies uh, if the firearm facilitated or had the potential for facilitating the other felony offense. Now, the, here the probation officer didn't say that that was a basis for the enhancement, the government didn't advance that as a basis for the enhancement, and the district court did not rely on that as the basis for the enhancement. Instead, the district court applied the enhancement based on the special rule that applies when the other felony offense is a drug trafficking offense. In that situation, the enhancement applies if the drugs and the firearm were in close proximity to each other. Now here, you know, the proximity uh, aspect of it isn't an issue. Uh, the officers arrested Hughes in an apartment. Uh, the firearm was stuffed in between some sofa cushions and a couch where he'd been lying down recently. And then of course, there were the drugs in his pocket nearby. Um, so, <clears throat> Hughes objected to the pre-sentence report's recommendation of this enhancement and said that at most the evidence showed simple possession. Now, Hughes himself was a heavy methamphetamine user, particularly at this time. Uh, in the week leading up to his arrest, he'd been on a methamphetamine binge. Um, the pre-sentence report uh, said that he'd been using methamphetamine daily at that time. Uh, up to an ounce a day. Now, that's probably not uh, accurate because an ounce would be about 28 grams and that would be a lot for one person to consume in a single day. But the point is that the record shows that he was in fact a methamphetamine user and was using heavily at that time. The probation officer's response was that, well, the five and a half grams of meth and the six capsules of Adderall were a distributable amount and that the government would be able to put forth evidence and testimony at sentencing if necessary to establish that fact. And so then we get to sentencing. Again, the defense presents its objection and the district court says that, um, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with this other than from this side, uh, but that the court's sense was that there's almost a presumption that that amount of meth uh, and Adderall was an amount that could be presumed for production, or excuse me, for distribution. Now, didn't, didn't the government offer to produce a, an expert, but the district court said it was unnecessary? Well, correct me on that if I've got it wrong. Uh, that, that's correct. It's at uh, page 61 of the record, which is from the sentencing transcript. Um, the government conceded that it comes down to whether this was a personal use amount or a distributable quantity, and said, uh, I could bring in an agent or somebody experienced and they would testify, absolutely, that's an amount consistent with distribution. Um, the government acknowledged that cutting against that was the fact that uh, Hughes had a meth pipe in his pocket, which again is consistent with the fact that Hughes was himself a methamphetamine user. So the government said it's a distributable quantity, uh, but then said, I didn't think we needed testimony to dig through that. And the court said, I don't think you do either. Uh, the court said, I'm going to make the determination that it was a distributable amount. So there was no direct evidence of whether this was a distributable amount or an amount consistent with simple possession. Um, it is a relatively small amount of methamphetamine, and for somebody who's using heavily on a daily basis, 
it's certainly consistent with a personal use amount. Uh, also important here is the fact that there is no evidence of uh, other facts that are typically associated with drug distribution. There were no packaging materials, such as extra baggies that could be used to divide the methamphetamine into uh, smaller individual what portions. What is the current state of the law on that? I mean, in other words, the judge can make up his mind uh, whether it is a uh, distributable amount. I mean, is there any standard, or can, uh, is this just subject to the whim of the judge? Well, th there would have to be some evidence to support that inference. Um, the term drug trafficking offense, which is what's used in the application note, is not a defined term for purposes of this guideline. But, you know, based on case law, you know, it can turn on whether this was a distributable amount or an amount consistent with uh, uh, simple possession for personal use. But there does have to be some evidence, and especially here where, you know, the government's conceding there's evidence that points both ways. And the court says, you know, it's not really familiar with what would be a distributable amount or not, although you know, the court thought that maybe it could be presumed to be a distributable amount if it's over five grand. So that's... Are you saying that it always requires uh, some expert evidence or some expert testimony even uh, to support whether it is or is not a distributable amount, unless it's so much that it's just arbitrary? Uh, right, right. If there was a huge amount, if he'd possessed a kilo of meth, then we wouldn't be here having this argument. Um, but whether it comes in the form of expert testimony from a law enforcement officer or somewhere else, there's maybe something that the probation officer could provide about similar cases, I'm not sure, but there has to be something more than just the bare fact of this amount of drugs coupled with essentially an assumption that it was a distributable amount. Again, especially when Hughes himself was a heavy methamphetamine user at the time. Um, if we're trying to determine whether it's plausible in light of the record as a whole, to what extent can we also factor in, uh, granted $100 is not a remarkable amount of money in the drug trade, but he's got $100 in cash, he's got the five, I think you said five Adderall pills, and he, uh, which, which isn't part of, from what I understood, the meth problem that he's having or his meth the binge you just mentioned and also the firearm can we consider those things as well well uh, a couple of points one on the Adderall um, as the government pointed out in its brief Adderall is nearly identical to methamphetamine in its in, in, in its chemistry and in its effect on the user it's basically legal methamphetamine so the fact that he possessed Adderall in addition to the methamphetamine is entirely consistent with personal use um, as for the $100, uh, it's actually not clear how much currency uh, was in Hughes' pocket when he was arrested. Uh, the PSR doesn't say. Uh, the $100 figure comes from, I guess, a factual dispute uh, between Hughes and the person uh, from whom he got the firearm. So what precipitated this was that uh, a friend of Hughes called the police and said Hughes had stolen a gun from him. So the police show up at the apartment where Hughes was staying at the time, asked him about it, and Hughes said, yes, I have the firearm, it's over there in the sofa cushions. Hughes said that he had loaned $100 to his friend and that his friend had given him the gun as collateral for the loan. And then a week or so later, this happened. Um, so is $100 in cash coupled with the other evidence? That's the $100 that's referenced is his his statement that he loaned it, or was there $100 or thereabouts on his person at the time? That he loaned it. That he loaned it, okay. Right, so that comes from uh, the PSR. Um, the probation officer recommended that he receive the acceptance of responsibility reduction, and it includes the statement that Hughes provided to support that. And in that statement, he said, a friend asked for a $100 loan to go to a game room, he gave me his handgun to hold as collateral. Um, as for what the officers found, the PSR says that a search of the defendant yield uh, search of the defendant yielded in the discovery of a clear baggie containing a crystal-like substance, which was the methamphetamine, U.S. currency, 
no amount specified. This is at page 73 of the record. A clear glass pipe with a white substance in a black and color bag containing six Adderall capsules. So while, you know, in a hypothetical case, the amount of drugs, some amount of currency, perhaps other materials consistent with distribution such as other packaging materials, scales, cutting agents, depending on the case, currency in conjunction with other evidence might be enough, but here uh, it wasn't. At, at best, this was, you know, on the bubble, again, as the government conceded at sentencing. There's the amount of methamphetamine, which the government said was distributable, and we can bring in a witness, but we don't think the court actually believes that. But there was also the glass pipe. So <clears throat> in terms of, you know, whether it was uh, implausible in light of the record as a whole, um, I don't think there's enough evidence to support the district court's finding, particularly given the fact that when it comes to a guidelines increase like this, it's the government that bears the burden of proof uh, to establish the factual predicate. Um, and here, in the face of a written objection from the defense, all the government said was that we can, we can produce the evidence in the form of a witness, and then at sentencing, the government said the same thing, but also said, I don't think the court needs that. And so uh, there has to be more. And on these facts, it was clear error for the court to find that uh, this was a drug trafficking offense rather than simple possession, and therefore error to apply the enhancement. Uh, unless there are any further questions. You've saved time for a bottle, Mr. Bergen. Thank you. Mr. Spellmark. So how many Fifth Circuit arguments is this for you? Have you kept track? About 150. Okay. I, figured I still we'd... have not done a big one yet. <laughs> um, may it please the court, the, the district court could infer plausibly that Hughes possessed a firearm in connection with distribution. The firearm was reported stolen. The, the, all of the uh, excuse about giving it as collateral, no one has ever, uh, no court has ever or the probation officer has ever said that that's a credible explanation. Um, it's, a, it's a reported stolen firearm. He previously had stolen a 40 caliber firearm. The gun is between the sofa cushions where he's sitting and, and sleeping in close proximity to the drugs. Um, the gun was readily available for the protection of those drugs. 5.5 grams of methamphetamine, 3.4 grams of how do we know? How do we know whether this amount of drugs was a distributable amount or not. How do we, how are we supposed to know that? Well, that's, it, 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 a distributable amount is going to be inconsistent with personal use, so you... Well, what does that mean? It, it, I'm about to use it more than somebody else. That, that's true. It, and I'm as you... Your Honor, I'm a real dope head. Right. He gets a better break than somebody that gets up right. and says, "Look, I'm very discreet about using it." Right. As you said, if there's a huge amount of drugs, then then there's no question. If there's an amount, but in this case, we're talking about this case. And in this case, right. So what's the deal in this case? In, in this case, we, the the court found the amount that, that rings the bell to be a, a distributable amount based on his experience, and. And then as to the government's proffer. Is it? Is that it? So what is the judge, next judge experience? Oh, well, the evidence, the evidence is the proffer. If the court accepts the proffer, the proffer is evidence. So the, the proffer was that uh, an expert would testify absolutely that this is an amount consistent with distribution. That in, in the Freeman case, there was, there was no other hallmarks of trafficking. I mean, did the judge err in accepting the testimony of the expert without allowing him to be cross-examined by? Well, that's that that that's an important question. There, there's no objection by the defense. There's no request to hear more details. He doesn't say, "Well, really, an expert is needed." Um, it, 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 three times he has the chance when the, when the government first mentions it, when, when the, the government says, well, I don't think it's needed, and then when the court agrees it's not needed, multiple times the defense just stands silent, um, 
not laying behind the log as to this proffer. And without an objection, with the court accepting the proffer or implicitly accepting the proffer, the proffer is evidence. And then ... What is the standard of review here then that he failed to object to the district courts accepting the testimony of the expert without submitting to cross-examination? What is the standard of review that we have here? Well, the classic formulation is that when the government presents evidence and then the burden shifts to show that that evidence is materially untrue, generally it's a preponderance of evidence here about whether you can infer plausibly that he possessed the firearm in connection with distribution. There's also ... there's other things here too. The PSR found that Hughes had no income, no assets, and yet he has money to buy drugs and supposedly loan money. That's a further circumstance pointing to being in the drug distribution business. And we have ... it was remarked that he had an amount of currency and there is no statement in the PSR as to exactly the amount of currency. There's no statement in the PSR as to the caliber of the pistol, although that's readily discoverable. Did this court decide as a matter of law what is and is not a distributable amount? I mean, would that work or is that a bad idea? The court has said that mere possession of a quantity of drugs that's inconsistent with personal use ... In a way you're fading off. I'm sorry? You're fading off there at the last ... Oh, I'm sorry. Well, the court's found that mere possession of a quantity of drugs that's inconsistent with personal use will ... A distributable amount is ... my point would be a distributable amount is generally inconsistent with personal use. It's not a matter of certainty. I don't understand what that means. Well, let me give you ... let me give you another example. In the Freeman case where there was no ... what he would describe as hallmarks of trafficking. And so the narcotics officer testified, this amount would generally not be for personal use, but rather was potentially enough weight to distribute narcotics. And then this court in the next sentence, it says, it thus follows that the amount of crack cane, this crack cocaine, this was four grams, found in the vehicle was sufficient potentially to establish the felony offense of possession with intent to distribute. It's not a ... it must be for sure, but if it's a distributable amount, and here we have the proffer that was accepted by the district court that it's a distributable amount, and that constitutes a preponderance of evidence that it's a distributable amount and that the presumption would apply that it would be for a facilitation. The briefs were very short. I don't think I have anything extra to say, Your Honors, if you don't have any more questions. Thank you, Mr. Stelmach. Thank you. Mr. Bogan, you've saved some time for rebuttal. A few points. First, the government places a lot of weight on what it describes as a proffer being evidence to support a finding that this was a distributable amount. Whether it's properly characterized as a proffer or not, this is really nothing more than the prosecutor standing before the court and saying it's a distributable amount with no evidence to back that up. And this court has said that the unsworn allegations ... Let me ask you a problem in the government here that he said, the court said that it's based on experts. I don't need an expert to tell me that this is a distributable amount. So he accepted the proffer of the government that this was a distributable amount and there was no objection to it. Where does that leave you? 
Well, it, 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 it leaves us uh, in the position that I mentioned during my opening, which is that the government bears the burden of, on this. We objected. That meant that the government had to come forward with evidence to support this if there wasn't already adequate evidence in uh, the pre-sentence report or from some other source that was but before. Your position is that you'd already made the objection and you did not need to object to the government, I mean to the court's acceptance of the government's expert. Yes. Under uh, Rule 51, it's sufficient for a party to make the court aware of the basis for the objection such that the court can rule on it. Here we did that. We filed a written objection with the probation officer and we made the objection at sentencing as well. And I don't think that the court, uh, the district court at sentencing referred to uh, expert testimony. Um, all the court said is that in fairness, it may be simple possession, but it was possession of 5.5 grams, which I think rings the bell to be a distributable amount, uh, whatever that means. Uh, but the court also said, I don't have a lot of experience with this other than from this side. And so perhaps the court was referring to uh, other cases, but uh, beyond that, I'm not sure um, exactly uh, what the court was relying on there. Um, and then, again, the government said, I didn't think we needed testimony uh, to dig through that, referring to establishing that this was a distributable amount. And the court said, I don't think you do either. So. I'm not sure that the court did actually rely on the representations of the prosecutor, which again, unsworn allegations of the prosecutor are not evidence. Um, the, the second point I would make is that uh, the government argues that <coughs> Hughes's uh, version of events that the firearm was collateral for a hundred dollar loan uh, is not credible. But again, the pre-sentence report included that statement uh, from Hughes uh, as part of the justification for granting him an acceptance of responsibility reduction. The government didn't object to that, and the district court adopted the pre-sentence report, which necessarily means that the court accepted Hughes's representation on that point uh, as truthful. Otherwise, the court wouldn't have been in a position to grant him acceptance of responsibility if that wasn't if that wasn't true, if Hughes was lying about that, uh, and also it potentially would have put Hughes on the hook for an obstruction of justice enhancement if he'd lied to the court about that. So um, at worst, there's no credibility finding at all from the court, district court uh, on Hughes's version of events. Uh, at best, the district court necessarily accepted that by adopting the pre-sentence report and sentencing him consistent with an acceptance of responsibility reduction. Uh, unless there are any further questions, I'd ask the court to vacate the sentence and remand for resentencing without the enhancement. Thank you, Mr. Bogan. Your case is under submission. Second case.